good. All right. So uh, the case we're talking about today is called Moore v. Harper. Did anyone read it? Did anyone skim it? Yes? Okay. So part of what Moore v. Harper is about is gerrymandering, and I know not everyone is from the United States. Not everyone cares about politics. So we're going to talk about what gerrymandering is and how does it function first. That guy over there is Elbridge Gary. His, his name is Gary, not Jerry. Uh, just kind of evolved over time. And that's his original district, which looks like a, whatever that animal is. So gerrymandering works like this, and it doesn't matter what color it is, doesn't matter what party it is, this is how it functions. So you have voters that are 60% blue, 40% red, and you can draw them so blue wins all districts just by winning each one by a very small amount. You can draw it the other way, where red wins three districts and blue wins two, which completely ignores in both cases the actual distribution of votes for the districts. We're on board with what gerrymandering is, right? Anyone confused about what gerrymandering is? Okay. So the next question is, why does gerrymandering exist? What are the justifications for doing so? There are actually two types of gerrymandering. Actually, there's three, but I'm going to talk about two. There's partisan gerrymandering, and there's bipartisan gerrymandering. Does anyone have any idea what bipartisan gerrymandering is? No? Does anyone have any idea what partisan gerrymandering is? Like divided Republican Democrats, so you make like strongholds as in like Democrats win by 60 40 margins all the time. Yeah, and then bipartisan gerrymandering is less common in terms of the news coverage, but it's actually more common in the United States. So, what bipartisan gerrymandering is, is essentially instead of drawing a political advantage, the incumbents get the safest districts possible. This results in districts that are like 75 25, and the incumbent has no fear of not getting reelected. And you call it bipartisan because both parties have a vested interest in not having competitive districts. Therefore, the incumbents basically stay permanent. The positives of gerrymandering are, therefore, quote unquote, competitiveness. So, in order to do a gerrymander, you have to have a less safe district swinging your way. So, that's Pennsylvania from 2016. And these districts, you can see the blue one down there, 16, that's actually a Democratic district that a Republican won. So that's part of a, what's called a dummy mander, where you want it to go one way and it goes the other way. And you can see just above it, I believe, the, what is it, the seventh, or below it, the 17th was a Republican district that a Democrat won. So that's called a dummy mander, where you want it to go one way to get more seats and actually go the other way. So the positive effect is you have some competitive districts by the very nature that you don't want a bunch of uncompetitive districts. The bad part is what I'm about to show you. The negatives of partisan gerrymandering are it obfuscates people's votes. So this is Pennsylvania's map from 2002. In that election, the Democrats got 50% of the vote. And you can see they ended up with about seven districts out of 18. So that's not great in terms of electoral representation. Uh, another problem is loss of incumbents. So what they did in this map is the 12th district actually contained three incumbents. So they drew three incumbent Democrats into the 12th. And John Murth ends up winning the primary, but you lose two incumbent Congress people just by drawing a district that goes from Johnstown, which is not far from us, all the way to Ohio. The other issue with partisan gerrymanders is the legislators themselves get to pick their constituents. So they're going to pick something that's really advantageous to themselves, not necessarily what's advantageous to the state. The negatives of bipartisan gerrymandering. So that's Mississippi. The left one is their congressional map, and the right one is their state house map. You notice in both, there is no competitive districts. There's lean districts, but there's nothing that's competitive. And the issue with this is it doesn't reflect the constituency of Mississippi. Mississippi's gubernatorial election in 2023 was 50% to 48%. These maps on the congressional side indicate a 20% uh, Democratic constituency and an 80% Republican constituency, which is not accurate for the state of Mississippi. Similarly with the state senate district. Uh, the other issue is if every state has these bipartisan gerrymanders, the competitiveness of the nation's house is really low. Currently, we only have 24 competitive districts in the entire country out of 435. So what that means practically is we're basically buying over 24 seats, and the rest of the people in those seats that are really not competitive, they don't have the... the electoral competency to influence legislation. So if you're a minority in one of those districts, your vote matters very little. 
And the other issue with having less competitive districts is the funding that people get in safe districts doesn't end up going to their races. It ends up getting funneled to these 24 districts. So like Nancy Pelosi, for instance, in a very safe district, she raises the most amount of money in the country, but she doesn't spend it on her own campaign. She spends almost all of it on these competitive districts. So it changes from one person, one vote, to this nationwide pinpoint on these 24 districts. So what are the, oh, the drawbacks? What allows gerrymandering to exist? Does anyone have an idea of why it exists? What's the legal function of how it exists? No. All right. So this is the election clause in the Constitution. It's Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1. And it says, the times, places, manners of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But Congress, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. So does anyone have any idea what this means? Someone has to raise their hand. <laughs> I don't care if it's wrong. Which one? <laughs> With whoever feels more confident. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, essentially, the legislators get to make their own rules and decide how everything works, and it's their own discretion, and so they want to do what's most advantageous to themselves. And Which legislators? The ones that are actively elected. In which body? Congress. Senators and representatives. It's not Congress and it's not the Senate. The State House. Yeah, the State Legislature. So your State House and your State Senate, according to Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 of the Constitution, gets to choose how congressional districts are drawn, meaning your State Legislature draws the federal House districts. Is everyone on board with that? Make sense? So what are some examples of law that Congress enact that change this clause? And you all should know this one. It's a very prominent law, at least one. And again, I will not. You have someone else to raise your hand. Is it the Voting Rights Act? Yep, that's one of them. The Civil Rights Act. Any act of Congress that affects the electing of people to Congress is an obfuscation of the clause, but it's permissible because it explicitly says Congress can make laws regulating the election of Congress people. Make sense? I'm sorry, at the end I don't get it. Who are really the ones that are in charge of the laws of, for, for the people in Congress? So you, remember, Congress. so you may, you remember how we did the horizontal thing? We have state legislatures, uh -huh. and we have one big legislature. The state legislatures get to choose the manner of how to choose Congress people. And it's super complicated. This, this whole thing is going to be complicated, just as a FYI. So the state legislature, which are lower level legislators, get to draw the maps. But Congress retains the right to regulate the drawing of those maps. So for instance, with the Voting Rights Act, it, re, it was about diversity representation. So there were states in the South that would draw maps that would allow no minority representation. And so when they passed the Voting Rights Act, that's actually what created the second district in Mississippi. So that district would not exist without the voting rights. That makes sense? It's complicated. To what extent does this grant power to the state legislature? Does anyone have any idea what the power of the state legislature is according to this uh, clause? It would give them the power to like draw the congressional district maps, but it wouldn't allow them to have any jurisdiction over like the senators or the final placement of it. I think it would still need reviewed. Okay. Does anyone else have any input on drawing the maps? Is there any other actor that can regulate how the maps are drawn? The, uh, the judiciary can. Which judiciary? The uh, state Supreme Courts. The state Supreme Courts. Does anyone else have any ideas? When the, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court. Anyone else? Those are both right, by the way. Whenever they uh, appoint, like, they make commissions in states to review gerrymandered maps and come to a consensus on fixing them. Do you know what those commissions are called? I don't know. We're going to cover it. They're called independent redistricting commissions. They're meant to take power away from the state legislature and towards a, quote-unquote, bipartisan consensus on drawing the maps. Okay, and also, obviously, Congress can regulate this. So there's multiple actors, but the power really is vested in the state legislature. And does anyone, I guess we kind of covered this. The other type of gerrymandering is minority gerrymandering, 
which is covered in Shabi, Reno, where you draw a district specifically for a minority in your state. And that is unconstitutional and it's under strict scrutiny. So if you do do it, it has to have some sort of justification as to why you're doing it. Is anyone familiar with independent state legislature theory? You should be, because it's, it's a major legal theory. And so does anyone want to just read what the slide says and try to explain why it, what it means? Okay, I'll do it. The theory suggests that when the Constitution says the legislature, remember this is the clause we just looked at, it means the legislature somehow independent of the rest of the state government, meaning the state court, the governor. The theory is a device designed to limit the ability of state courts when they interpret the state statutes or the state constitution from imposing constraints or setting aside provisions of the state legislature regarding federal elections. Does anyone understand what that means? Does anyone not understand what that means? You don't understand what it means? No. In plain English, the independent state legislature theory proposes that no other body, aside from Congress, can regulate the redrawing of congressional maps, meaning the governor can't do it and the state Supreme Court can't do it which is what Walt said, the state Supreme Court theoretically can regulate this. But in this theory of law, they wouldn't be able to. It would just be the state legislature. Does anyone have any understanding of what the practical effects would be if the state legislature and state legislature alone was left to do this with no governor input, no state court input? I mean, obviously they could just structure the districts however they want to include various groups of people in districts you could essentially create all majorities I guess yeah so whoever had the majority in the state house at the time that they're redrawing the maps would be able to just basically construct the maps so they basically can just keep getting super majorities in, in the elections and could like really knock down the number of seats or elections that the opposing party could win and, and whenever the majority changes like they would just change it again and like there would be no stability I think yeah. Well, the issue with the majority changing is that they don't just get to draw the congressional districts. They draw their own state house districts and state senate districts. So there are legislatures that once they get in the majority, they won't just redraw the congressional districts. They'll redraw both of those districts so that they never lose the majority. And that happens in a number of states where the actual electorate is, is you know, pretty competitive, but the state legislature is not. And that's what happened in Pennsylvania. We had, until last year, and the, we'll get into this, we had a permanent state majority for Republicans. So they would intentionally draw the maps, even though Pennsylvania, if you don't know, is very competitive. It's usually 50-50. But it wasn't competitive in the state legislature because they were drawing their own maps. Are there any benefits to this theory that anyone can think of? Uh, just something that comes to mind is like that figurehead of the governor would have a lot of influence over it and like retaining the political control for his own party into the future it just kind of like takes away the influence from everyone else as you mentioned any other benefits i must say i'm biased i do not think there's a lot of benefits <laughs> i mean i'm biased because i'm from nebraska and nebraska like 90 percent of the districts are around lincoln and then like there's just one really big district for the rest of the state so it's definitely not very representative all right, how about the drawbacks? What are the issues with a theory like this? As Brooke mentioned, you can create supermajorities. Any other drawbacks? I'm kind of alluding to a issue with the state courts. They're on your So the, we'll get into it, but the state court has the job of reviewing its own constitution. And if you remove the state court from that, anything that the state legislature did would not have to follow the state constitution, which is a major issue for certain states, because as we learn in this class, state constitutions are oftentimes very different than the federal constitution, have different provisions. And that's true in Pennsylvania, which is what we're going to get into. So this is a map of how each legislature does redistricting. All the red ones are more or less completely controlled by the state legislature. So those are the ones that are gonna be drawn by politicians, for politicians, and for themselves. The yellow ones have these independent redistricting commissions, which Brooke mentioned, 
And so there's supposed to be these bipartisan things where the map is supposed to be an accurate reflection of the community, but they have different outcomes because they're not necessarily all the same. And the ones that aren't shaded in don't have another congressional district, so they don't have an option to draw a map. The first case I'm going to talk about, which you probably did not read, is VF, V, I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm not French. Um, but the case essentially is hinging on the map to, on the 2004 side. So the 2000 side was the old map in Pennsylvania. These are our congressional districts. And this map right here, you have 11 out of 22 Democrats. And that was pretty reflective of the state. On the map, the 2004 map, you have 7 out of 19 Democrats, which is not reflective of the state. And this individual, VF, was a registered Democrat in Pennsylvania, and he brought suit against Brulier, which I think is how you say it. And these are the facts of the case. Essentially, what I just said, this voter believed these maps were gerrymandered, and he sued, and he got all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And this decision is 5-4. The issue in the case is, does the issue of political gerrymandering constitute a non-justiciable non political question and capable of adjudication by the courts? Before I show you the whole thing, does anyone have an idea about how this case turned out? Just based on vibes. What's your vibe? <laughs> no vibes. <laughs> I need someone to raise their hand because I don't want to talk the whole time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that the gerrymandering was okay. It was okay? So you're saying it's, is it non-justiciable? Non which, which, by the way, means the court doesn't believe they can review this. They're just saying, not our problem. I'll just, I'm guessing uh, it was a political question they wouldn't answer. I'm guessing that it was justiciable. Okay. They can't answer it. Why do you think that? Um, because I'm pretty sure courts still side on it, right? All right. The whole thing is right there. I'm going to read it, try to read it. If we could identify majority parties from Justice Scalia, we would find it impossible to assure that that party wins a majority of seats. Unless we radically revise the state's traditional structure for elections and any winner-take-all district system, there can be no guarantee, no matter how the district lines are drawn, that a majority of party votes statewide will produce a majority of the seats for that party. While we do not lightly overturn one of our holdings, when governing decisions are unworkable or badly reasoned, this court has never felt constrained to follow precedent. 18 years of essentially pointless litigation have persuaded us that Vandemer is incapable of principal application and would therefore overrule that case and decline to adjudicate these political gerrymandering claims. So the significance of this case is the case that he mentioned said that they could adjudicate political gerrymandering. That's Vandemer. This case overturns that and they say, not our problem. The court says, historically, they don't decide political questions. So they decided this is a political question, and it's not their problem. Is anyone confused about the holding? This is the United States Supreme Court. They're saying, hands off, not our problem. We got it? So it's non-justicable? Yes, okay. non-justicable. They they're saying, in the case, they say, very well might be a partisan gerrymander, but it's not our problem, which overrules a previous case, Bandemer, which said it was their problem. Then we have Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. The facts in this case are that the state of Arizona has a mechanism in their elections where the state itself, not the legislature, can vote on legislation. The legislation they passed as voters was to approve an independent redistricting commission, which is what Brooke talked about. So instead of having the state legislature draw the maps, they have a commission that draws the maps that's nonpartisan. The issue here is that the Arizona State Legislature did not want that power taken away from them. So they sued, and they got away with the Supreme Court. And the issue in the case is, does the Elections Clause permit a state's electorate to transfer legislative redistricting from the state le legislative representatives to an independent commission? We're going to do a, how do you think this turned out again? Yes or no, are they allowed to transfer power to the independent redistricting commission? Anyone have any vibes, ideas? I'm going to say, yeah, they were allowed to delegate. Does anyone think they weren't allowed to delegate? Good. They were. They were allowed to delegate. This is from Justice Ginsburg. 
She says, the Arizona Constitution establishes the electorate of Arizona as a coordinate source of legislation on equal footing with the representatives of the legislative body. This means the voters, when they vote on ballot amendments, when they vote on a referendum, it is exactly the same as the legislature. Redistricting plans adopted by the Arizona legislature sparked controversy in every redistricting cycle since the 1970s, and several of those plans were rejected by a federal court or refused preclearance by the Department of Justice under the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And again, the Voting Rights Act is constitutional because, according to Clause 1 of the Elections Clause, you can intervene through Congress to regulate the election of representatives. We resist reading the Elections Clause to single out federal elections as the one area in which states may not use citizen initiatives as an alternative legislative process. Nothing in that clause instructs, nor has this court ever held, that a state legislature may prescribe regulations on the time, place, manner of, election, of holding federal elections in defiance of provisions of the state's constitution. So it's a state constitutional question that they decided was permissible, we can't have an independent redistricting commission. Everyone clear on the outcome here? Cool. What distinguishes Jabrulier and the independent redistricting case? What is different about them? Whether they're issues, facts, holding, what is different about these two cases? these situations, the former, we're dealing with uh, whether or not it's a, a justiciable or a political question, and the second one is just whether or not it's permissible under the Constitution, delegation theory very much. Anyone else? What distinguishes them? If I'm not mistaken, the first case was about like what the actual state legislation did, and the second case is the delegation of that power. Yes. So everyone clear on that distinction? They're not saying we can't justice this one, the second one. They're saying we can decide whether these provisions are constitutional, but they won't decide on what a gerrymander is. And that's a pretty important distinction because the Supreme Court still to this day will not decide on what a gerrymander is. And the point of these two cases and showing you them is that we're going to see state courts take over that role instead of the federal courts. What other methods are there to adjudicate gerrymandering? So if you think you have a gerrymander on your hands and you don't like it, what other methods can you use if not the federal court system? <coughs> no thoughts. That answer is the state court. The state court, as of these decisions, could still review the Constitution. And so Justice Kennedy was in the majority in both those cases. He was in the majority on the non justifiable question he was in the majority on the redistricting question. Why do you think he was in the majority on both cases? Doesn't have to be perfect. Just anyone have an idea why he would be in the majority on both of those? He's very much in favor of upholding like the credibility of the Supreme Court and like not making any like really drastic decisions from the status quo so that court maintains its credibility. So your thoughts is more of a consequentialist view yeah. of the court. Anyone else? Come on, Tommy, I know you want to say something. <laughs> I have nothing on this. It these are extremely complicated questions, so no worries. So the case we're here to talk about today is called Moore v. Harper. And those are the facts, but it, did anyone actually read the case? Like, they actually understand the facts of the case? Because you all shook your heads, but I don't see any hands. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll tell you. So the plaintiffs, which are voters in North Carolina, they challenged the constitutionality of the maps that the North Carolina Supreme Court, or legislature drew. They relied on an article of the state constitution, which is the important part. Remember, the federal courts can't decide this. So they're relying on their state constitution to challenge gerrymandering. The North Carolina Supreme Court said, yes, this is a partisan gerrymander, and struck down the maps. After which, the, the state legislature took it to the federal courts. And they were relying on our old friend, in the uh, independent state legislature theory, to prevail in this circumstance. This is an extremely important case. And all these things over here, those are all titles of law review articles. You can see that people are pretty worried about how this case is going to turn out. Okay? And that's the independent state legislature theory. And the question is, 
how would independent state legislature theory apply to this case in which a state Supreme Court has said it's gerrymandered, but they're appealing to the federal courts? Why would that apply? I mean, it kind of attacks like they're holding their weight because you're kind of limiting their ability to judge the matter. So how would that change the case? If the court adopted ISL, how would it change the outcome? I think it would, because didn't, if I'm not mistaken, they originally like, I would change their holding on it. Yeah, it wouldn't just change their holding, it would nullify their validity to even review these cases. Yeah, because it's saying that the power is not. Yes, no power for the state court in a situation like this because of the elections clause. So the issue in this case is, does the elections clause exempt state legislatures from ordinary exercise of state judicial review? So my first question for this is, how would each side of the case look like? So we just talked about one side. What would happen if it was decided that they could review their state courts? What would be the outcome there? The state courts could review the Constitution on this issue. If the state courts couldn't review it, there would never really be a method of reviewing it in any way because the federal courts could and the state courts could, so there would be no intervention. Yeah, so you lose the state court option. You already lost the federal court option. So there's no longer a check on the state legislature at all in any way. It's just they do whatever they want. And again, these are the people that also draw their own maps to keep themselves the majority. So that's why people were so afraid of how this could turn out. Does anyone have a guess about how the case turned out? It was 6-3. Think about the composition of the court right now. I would guess that that did not happen. What didn't happen? That they allowed the state courts to continue reviewing. They allowed it? Does anyone think they did not allow state courts to review their own constitutions according to the elections clause? They did not allow it. Okay. Here's the whole thing. And it was 6-3, but three conservative justices sided with the three liberal justices on this case. And the whole thing says this. Before the Constitutional Convention convened in the summer, oh, actually, there's a lot of slides in this, so I don't know if I want to read all these. I have like six slides of this one. <laughs> so essentially, Roberts argues from a historical perspective, the state courts have always been allowed to review their own constitutions. And he leans on the Federalist. He leans on originalism. Same thing. Same thing. The whole thing here is state courts retain the authority to apply state constitutional constraints when legislatures act under the power conferred upon them by the elections clause. But federal courts must not abandon their own duty to exercise judicial review. In interpreting state law in this area, state courts may not exceed the bounds of ordinary judicial review so as to unconstitutionally intrude upon the role specifically reserved to state legislatures by the elections clause. Because we need not decide whether that occurred in today's case, the judgment of North Carolina Supreme Court is affirmed. Does anyone have any idea what that holding means? Because there's two parts of that that are really important. This is not a political question, but it is a judicial or a judicial question because the North Carolina Supreme Court said strikes down the drawing of the maps. What about the other part? What was the other part? Spacing out, sorry. So it's, you should read the, read the bottom paragraph and tell me if you think there's anything important in there other than the fact that they can review their own state constitutions. All right, I'll just tell you. They open the door to the Supreme Court adjudicating whether the Supreme Court is going too far. Because the other main issue in this case is that you have these state legislators and they want the maps the way they want the maps. And they're not going to compromise on that. So oftentimes when the state Supreme Court strikes down their maps, they don't draw the maps themselves. The court doesn't draw the maps. They say, you have till this date to draw new maps. And does anyone have any guess what the state legislature does when they have a date imposed upon them by the court? Do they draw the maps, not draw the maps? Anyone have any thoughts? They don't. They don't draw the maps. Anyone have a differing opinion? But you're right. They don't draw the maps. 
They refuse to draw the maps. Never, in my experience, reviewing this case law, have they drawn the maps when they were told to draw the maps. They'll redraw maps. They'll be exactly the same as one before. And their hope is, because there's a deadline, they're just going to approve them, which is not what happens. What actually happens in Pennsylvania and North Carolina is that the state court ends up drawing the maps. And the important part of this holding is the Supreme Court is saying, if they draw those maps, we may review that. We may say that's a gerrymander the other way. So it's, it's an important holding. They don't give absolute authority to the state courts. They say, we will review this if you do end up doing it. But like I said, for the most part, what ends up happening is the state court draws maps, which is not their role according to the Elections Clause. The Elections Clause does not say the state Supreme Court draws congressional maps. And this is Justice Thomas's dissent. And his argument, more or less, is ISL. He's saying the state court has no right to intervene here. They never should have got to the Supreme Court, and we shouldn't have even decided this case. His view is that the legal authority of the state Supreme Court, we should just completely ignore it. This holding isn't even valid. He's saying, according to the Constitution, the maps are imposed, are already the maps, and there's nothing else for us to talk about. So he very much disagrees with the majority on this one. Does anyone agree with the majority? You can just raise your hands. Does anyone agree with the dissent? You can agree with the dissent. I'm not going to get mad. What's the strongest argument for the majority that it should be decided the way it was? Our government is based on a system of checks and balances, and it's important to maintain those. Historical argument. Historical arguments, so originalism. Anyone else have any arguments for why the majority was right? All right, anyone want to argue that the dissent was right? It doesn't have to be your personal opinion. Well, I'm not decided with which side I would ultimately side with, but something that I uh, was considering was that um, if the state Supreme Courts can always redraw them themselves, then there's really no point in the state. I don't know if I see the point in the state legislature doing it, um, especially in a state like Pennsylvania when um, – the legislature could go one way, and then the, ju the uh, Supreme Court could go the other way. Uh, Party-wise, the uh, Supreme Court would just have the final say every time and could essentially act as the legislature. Yeah, and that's a major issue because in Pennsylvania, we, we, are, we have a one-seat majority in our house, and the other way is a majority of the other party. So drawing these maps, if it was just the state legislature, would be incredibly difficult because the state legislature is willing to say, fine, let, we'll let them expire. But the issue with that is when you lose a congressional seat or gain a congressional seat, you can't have the same maps because you have not the right amount of legislators, which creates a kind of a crisis. And as Walt said, there's a little bit of a fear in letting the state court just redraw them. Uh, what happened in Ohio with this case is that they said the maps were unconstitutional, but the legislature refused to draw the maps, and it was too late to impose new maps. So they used the unconstitutional maps, and those are still in place. So there's all sorts of conflicts here with checks and balances, and it's not a you know trivial issue. This is a major issue in the country. Does this case conflict with any past precedents that you're aware of? Is there anything it, that it contradicts? Was it the first case that, that you discussed about the political question? Yeah, because this does seem overtly political, mm -hmm. right? It's it's gerrymandering. It may be in a different cloth, but it does seem to be conflicting with our first case we talked about. Is there any other cases that it might conflict with? Justice Thomas argues that this is a conflict with the independent redistricting case from Arizona. He argues that in that case, we weren't saying who's going to review the case. We were saying the voters are the same as the legislature. And he's now, now the court has changed to saying, we're going to have the courts review no matter what. So he believes that's a conflict, and that they're actually overturning that prior law. What would be the issue, practically, if the dissent's view was the majority view, if this case went the other way? It's true. True. Anyone else? We basically covered that. 
An important thing to note is that all these cases are about Republican gerrymanders. Gerrymandering is not a one-party issue. It is a two-party issue. And in fact, in the next case I'm going to talk about, the reason why Pennsylvania was gerrymandered was in reaction to other states being gerrymandered, like California and Illinois. It is literally in the text of the case that the National Party called them and said, you're in a position to gerrymander, you need to go ahead and do it. So you can see up here, that's the popular vote. That's the amount of votes cast in this election. Democrats get 50% of the vote, Republicans get 49% of the vote, but the seats allocated, Republicans get 72% of the seats, and Democrats get 27% of the seats. Anyone see a problem with that? Me too. As a Democrat running for Congress, I see a major problem with that. So this is the map they imposed after that. This is a 2016 map, which actually took even more seats away. Or no, my apologies. This is a 2018 map. So at the conclusion of this state case in Pennsylvania, the state Supreme Court says the maps here are unconstitutional. And you can kind of see why they may be unconstitutional. You have this thing. It looks like a hammer. None of this is tracking counties. These are all split counties. I believe Brooke lives right here, right? Yeah, roughly right about there. Right there. So you're sharing a district with Johnstown, Southern Pennsylvania, and Eastern West Virginia, more or less. And these map, these ones are all screwed up. I, I live in Pennsylvania, and I'm from Pennsylvania. And I can tell you that these maps do not look adequate at all. Uh, and I'm not the only person that thinks that. A Republican state senator in response to these maps, said, all you have to do is look at them. So it benefited him. It benefited his party. But he sided with the other side because he's like, these are ridiculous maps. So the state Supreme Court comes in, and they say these are unconstitutional. And they give them a date. And they say, by this date, you have to create maps that don't split regions, that don't split counties, and don't split communities. And the state legislature said, we're good. We're going to keep the current maps. So the state Supreme Court draws this map which ends up reflecting roughly the distribution of voters. So you have nine and nine, nine Republicans, nine Democrats. The importance of this is that if Moore v. Harper was decided the other way, this map would actually be the one that's unconstitutional because it's drawn by the state Supreme Court. The holding in this case is essentially what I've already said. They rely on Pennsylvania's uh, constitution, which says elections have to be free and fair. That's not in the United States Constitution. It does not say that. But it does say it in Pennsylvania's Constitution. So the importance here is the state constitutionality of the actions that adjudicate gerrymandering. And if we had more of your Harper go the other way, none of this would be possible. That's the remedial plan. Oh. After this map was produced, multiple state senators, Pennsylvania Congress people, one state Supreme Court justice tried to file an emergency brief with the Supreme Court. It was denied. Tried to file another brief with the Middle District of Pennsylvania. It was denied. So this is a summary of what we talked about, to be clear on constitutional principles. Gerrymandering is a non-justifiable question for the U.S. Supreme Court. That is still good law. That is still a fact. Independent redition commissions are constitutional if implemented by the people. And state courts have the right to review their state constitutions, even when expressly delegated powers conveyed to the state legislatures in the election clause indicate otherwise. And then in non-IRC states, the state Supreme Court is the only body that can adjudicate partisan gerrymandering. Meaning if you don't have an independent redistricting commission, the only way you can stop this from happening is having a state Supreme Court review it. Does anyone have any questions about anything we've talked about? So this is kind of a broader question, and it might just be 